So hello everybody again. Uh, welcome to our uh, variation analysis and optimization seminar. So today we have Professor Javier Peña from Carnegie Mellon University. And I think, I think, I suspect this is actually the first talk Javier is giving in Australia, right? I was in Australia once many, many, many years ago. Oh wait, no, but I wasn't even, I went to a conference, but I didn't give a talk. So you're right. This is my first talk in Australia. Ever. First, first talk in Australia. So we're very privileged to have Javier talking for the first time here. Please, everybody, listen carefully, prepare your questions. And um, yeah, so I guess we can start. And okay. Javier, would you like well, to you. share your share thank screen? Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. I just uh, go quick here, check that. Uh, uh, so can everyone see my uh, cover page there, yes. my title? Yes, looks okay. good. So, uh, so again, thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it is very nice to have a chance to talk in the other side of the world and in such a convenient way. Uh, one of the few, few advantages of the crazy times that we are living in. So this is some joint work that I've done with my former um, doctoral student, David uh, Gutman, who is now at Texas Tech. And uh, the title of the talk is uh, The Condition Number of a Function Relative to a Set. Uh, just as a little kind of personal note, condition numbers are something that I've been working on and thinking about for many, many, many years. So in, to, to some extent, this, uh, this talk and this subject that I want to share with you today uh, summarizes things that I, I've been thinking for a long time that finally somehow come, came together in a, what I consider a relatively simple, maybe deceptively simple way. Um, so let me start by uh, a preamble that essentially just uh, uh, refreshes or revisits, uh, recalls the classical condition number, the kind of condition number that we learn in a basic uh, linear algebra course or the condition number of, uh, that is used in optimization for um, studying the properties of algorithms. So this is, if you flip through a matrix algebra textbook, this is usually the definition that you see of the condition number of a matrix. If you have a square non-singular matrix, the condition number is the norm of the matrix times the norm of its inverse, okay? Uh, and if we were using in some way the, more, the most natural norm, the Euclidean norm, this is also the largest singular value of uh, the matrix divided by the smallest singular value of the matrix. And now this, this quantity plays a very uh, central role in numerical linear algebra, is related to all sorts of properties of uh, problems that involve a system of equations where the matrix defines the equations. Now, we could actually take this a little bit further. There is no, we, the, the matrix need not be uh, square. We could think about a rectangular matrix. Uh, so if we look at a rectangular matrix, looking at the ratio of the largest to smallest uh, singular value still makes sense, right? Provided that that matrix is full um, rank. And then that ratio, it also is related to properties of then uh, something that I would like to suggest is like a, a, a generalization of, the, of this, the first problem. Instead of looking at solving the system of equations, we think about the least squares problem, AX minus B. Okay, the, the least squares uh, of AX minus B. Uh, this is an example that is going to be recurring throughout uh, the talk to motivate uh, what our main constructions, ideas, and results. Okay, so think about that. And again, the condition number that I'm, I'm noting here is can be related to essentially a number of properties of this problem, particularly with algorithms, uh, perturbation uh, results, and, and other, other things of that sort. Now, this can actually be taken a little bit long, a little bit farther, and that is uh, the context of optimization. If we have a uh, differentiable convex function, we can consider the uh, unconstrained minimization of that uh, function. And then this is maybe now a little bit more specialized. The, the, sometimes this ratio uh, LF over mu F that's called the condition number of the, of the function F. So what is LF and mu F? These are called, uh, so if the function that we are minimizing is a differentiable convex function, this is 
a kind of a, a central problem in convex optimization with a number of applications, particularly in data science. So the condition number, uh, what is this? This is that the ratio of the Bregman distance, the Bregman distance here to, uh oh, sorry, I fooled around with my mouse. Maybe I should put that aside. The, the uh, condition number is this quantity LF over mu F. LF is called the smoothness uh, of the function. The smoothness essentially has to do with how fast the uh, Bregman distance grows relative to the Euclidean norm. So if you look at this ratio here, the numerator here is what is called the Bregman distance. The Bregman distance is uh, this quantity here. It's a, it's a kind of a residual if you look at a first order approximation of the function around x. So that's LF is the uh, how, how is a certain growth bound on the growth of that Bregman distance. And mu f is the opposite, is a lower bound on uh, how that Bregman distance uh, grows. LF is called the smoothness parameter of the uh, function, and mu f is called the strong convexity constant. Mu f is positive when the function that we, uh, the function f is strongly convex. So that is the condition number of a function. If we think about the example that I mentioned in my previous slide, the least squares, the condition number of that uh, function is precisely the ratio that I mentioned there, sigma max over sigma min uh, square. So th that is the condition number. And what is special about condition numbers that are, as I said, this, this is related to properties of the problem. So uh, this is what I just mentioned in the previous slide. If we look at this particular function, this is maybe the, the canonical example, the least squares uh, function and for convenience, divide that by two, uh, then the smoothness constant is the, uh, is the uh, singular value of A, the largest singular value of A squared. The uh, strong convexity constant is the smallest singular value squared, which have a very nice uh, geometric interpretation. The uh, largest singular value is the ratio of the, um, ball, the smallest ball that, uh, in, that that contains the ellipsoid obtained by taking the image of the unit ball under A. And then the uh, mu f, which is this the smallest singular value, that is the ratio, the smallest singular value is the ratio of the largest ball that you can squeeze inside that uh, ellipsoid. So the figure below, it's, it explains what I'm saying in, in a more kind of pleasant picture. The black ellipsoid there is the image of uh, the unit ball under A. The blue uh, sphere, the blue circle there is the circle that contains that, um, the smallest circle that contains that ellipsoid. And the ratio of that circle is the largest singular value of A. And then the red circle there is the uh, largest circle that is included in that ellipsoid. Its ratio is the smallest singular value of A. The aspect ratio of that uh, ellipsoid, which is the ratio of the largest singular value to the smallest singular value, if we take the square of that, that is the uh, condition number of f. So that's one uh, aspect of conditioning that is, uh, that is interesting in terms of the, the geometry. Uh, if you're an optimizer, another reason that we care about condition numbers is that it's very closely related to how difficult a problem is, so in particular, it's considered again the minimization of f and uh, an ancient algorithm to solve that problem is an algorithm that actually uh, now is extremely popular and many vari variations of, of it are popular in, in data sciences. Uh, it, the folks in machine learning really popularized uh, first order methods enormously. So this is just the basic scheme that we all learn in a, in a, in, in, kindergarten optimization, right? Uh, the gradient descent algorithm. Then the convergence of the gradient descent algorithm is linear if we, if we apply it to a function that has a finite uh, condition number. And what is really neat is the rate of convergence is determined by the condition number in a very precise way. It's the, the two inequalities that you see down below. That is the iterates that the uh, gradient descent algorithm generate 
the E traits converge quadratic, um, converge linearly to the uh, set of minimizers. Uh, and the rate is essentially determined by the condition number. And also the objective uh, values of the E traits converge linearly to then the optimal value. Uh, and but as you see in the expression at the bottom. Okay, so that's the linear convergence of gradient descent. So that, that was my preamble. Let me tell you now what the main agenda for uh, the talk is. Okay, so the main agenda is essentially three items. So I reviewed what condition, the, the classic condition number, right, for matrices and for uh, differentiable uh, convex functions. I, uh, the main story that I want to tell you about is how uh, a construction of condition number in a relative sense, when we have a reference set. So that's, that's my main message today. And then my, our, my, what I would like to argue is that our construction is natural and is an extension of the classical construction. In particular, the same, uh, connection between the condition number and the convergence of the gradient descent extends to the convergence of first order methods in a, in a more general context that is mirror descent and for, for mirror descent and Frank Wolf algorithms. The geometric intuition of the condition number also has a neat extension to uh, our construction of relative condition numbers. So that, that is in just uh, three bullet points, uh, the story that I want to tell you. So let me tell you that story, right? So first, the first item here is the relative condition number. So it's, it, this is the goal. We want to construct, we want to construct a condition number for this constrained problem, okay? The classical uh, condition number is, you can think of it as uh, the condition number of a function that is associated to the unconstrained minimization problem here we want to think about this constrained problem where the set X in principle could be a fairly general uh, subset of the domain of F, okay? And then for additional flexibility in our construction, we are also going to use a distance function defined on X. The distance function, the reference distance function will allow us to give a construction that is not necessarily tied to the Euclidean norm. So it, it's a non-Euclidean construction that is more flexible, a bit more general. So, uh, so that's the goal, okay? And that is the story that I want to tell you. I, I want to, in the next couple of slides, I will tell you what is the construction. And in the remaining slides that I have in my talk, I'll tell you uh, why that construction is interesting. What can we say about that construction and how it extends the regular classical condition number. So. Here is uh, a little bit of a technical uh, kind of foundation here for, for the construction. So again, we are thinking about this, let's have this in, in the back of our mind, this kind of, this kind of constrained, constrained minimization problem. This is, we want a condition number for this. And we call it relative because we want to make it be relative to this reference set X. Okay, we want to incorporate the set X into our construction. Uh, and also, as I said, we want to rely on a possibly non-Euclidean distance D. So the triple F X D, we are going to assume that it satisfies these two uh, mild conditions. The function itself is convex and differentiable, and, uh, uh, or at least it's convex, and differentiable on the reference convex set X. So the, the set X, the reference set is a subset of the domain. The function is convex and differentiable on that, uh, on that set. And then D is uh, a distance function. Uh, so by this, sometimes maybe the, the, the name distance could be a bit misleading. Uh, sometimes this is called a pre-metric. All I'm asking about D is that it should be non-negative and it should be zero only when the two points X and Y are the same. So the reference distance function in particular doesn't, it, we, we do not ask it to be symmetric. D of Y, X need not be the same as D of X, Y. And then there is this key object. Uh, this is the kind of uh, object that, let's see. So, you know, something, 
we are among colleagues here, so I can you can relate to this uh, feeling when you have when one day you realize that there is such a strikingly simple construction that solves what has been bugging you and what has been confusing you for for a long, long, long time. So this construction here that looks a little maybe deceptively simple is in some way the the crux of our construction. The, I, we call this Z of fx, this set value mapping that, um, let me try to explain it in words, is essentially a, um, a level set. Uh, so, but not, it's not exactly a level set, it's a little bit more nuanced than a level set, is the largest uh, convex con component that matches for where the function f, the value of f, matches the value of uh, f at y. Okay, so z f x of y of any any point y here. I'm really sorry about this. My mouse is misbehaving. Uh, y is the set of points in in the set, so that for any point in the segment between x and y, the value of that f is equal to f of y. Okay, so think about that as again kind of like a level set, except that we're looking at um, the largest convex set that contains y where f is constant. This is, it turns out that this is going to be key for our construction. And finally, here is the construction. Okay, so re, let's, let's just uh, recall for a moment, the classical condition number was that the ratio of uh, smooth constant divided by strong convexity constant. What we have now is relative smooth constant divided by relative uh, convexity constant. So the, the numerator in the case, uh, the, the smoothness constant is a little bit easier to uh, grasp. For the smoothness constant, we just take the ratio of the Bregman distance of F divided by the reference distance D and the soup of that. So again, it's a kind of uh, upper bound on the growth of that Bregman distance. The strong convexity constant is a lower bound, but the lower bound has to be somewhat, um, we, we want to factor or uh, factor in the, this, this set value mapping that I mentioned in the previous slide, the Z mapping is like uh, the level set of Y. So it's the, it's the lower bound on how, how much the Bregman distance grows from X to any kind of Y, but we look at actually all of this divided by the reference distance. So what I want to describe next in the next couple of slides, this looks, of course, the first time you see this, it looks a bit technical. So I want to illustrate uh, what this gets us. So the first observation, the first thing that of course we would like to uh, verify is that if we look at a special case when the reference set is everything, and when the distance uh, is the Euclidean norm, then we recover the classical construction. And that is indeed the case. So again, if the reference set is all of Rn and the reference distance function is the Euclidean norm square, then the first quantity, the smoothness constant is the classical smoothness constant and the strong convexity constant, again, is the classical one. So we recover the classical construction in this fashion. Uh, here is another example that I want to um, discuss. And this is, again, the function that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. I said that that was a function that was going to be a recurrent example. So the least, the, the, the objective function in the least squares uh, problem that is ax minus b squared. This, is, this gets much more interesting because here is what I want to highlight. Uh, if, if we look at the traditional condition number of this function, again, just let me remind you that is the largest singular value of a divide, divided by the smallest singular value of a square of that, okay? Now let's, let's consider a very, very uh, simple situation that actually could be of a practical interest when the reference set is a linear subspace. So suppose that X is a linear subspace of Rn. And we look at just the Euclidean case also for the distance, for the reference distance. If that happens, then 
a, a little calculation shows that in this case, the reference at uh, the relative smooth convexity constant is the largest singular value, not of A, but of A restricted to the subspace X. And likewise, the smallest, the, the uh, strong convexity uh, constant, the mu, the strong convexity constant, is the smallest positive singular value of A restricted to X. Okay, so here A restrict, oh, I should have written X instead of L. So sorry about this, I kind of got mixed up here. A restricted to L for a, for a subspace L is just that, right? The, the, the mapping A restricted to that subspace. And when we write this sigma mean plus, I, I wrote this to highlight that this means the smallest positive singular value. So this is one key difference already between our construction and the classical construction. Even if the matrix A is rank deficient, for the least squares problem, we will always have a um, positive strong convexity constant because the strong convexity constant is the smallest positive singular value, okay? Uh, so even if the matrix A is rank deficient, our construction still makes sense and gives us a, a finite uh, relative condition number. Now, from in this particular example, it's very obvious that the uh, relative smooth convexity constant is smaller than the, uh, the, the, the classical one. And likewise, the uh, strong convexity constant is at least as large as the regular one, because obviously the singular value of A restricted to X is this, the, the largest singular value is smaller than the largest singular value of A and the other way around with the mean, okay? And actually it's not difficult to see that it, it, the condition, the relative condition number, if we were to look at the, the ratio of these two quantities can be arbitrarily smaller than the classical one. This should not come at a surprise. If you have a very ill conditioned matrix, but somehow you're looking only at a subspace, it is perfectly conceivable that in the subspace, the matrix is much better behaved. And that's exactly what our construction uh, captures here. So that's one example. Let me give you another example uh, that is a little bit more elaborate. This example, I can only kind of sketch and I will make a little bit more precise as we go through the rest of the talk. So this is another example uh, that uh, comes with a nice picture. And that's one of the reasons that I want to give this example. So suppose that the reference set, this is an example that is very, very uh, relevant for optimization and in particular for uh, conic programming. Suppose that the set X, the reference set is a convex cone. And again, let's consider the case when the reference distance is a, is a square uh, norm, okay? Uh, now, I'm gonna make a little bit of a technical assumption here just so that I can give my example um, a little bit more, uh, the, the example becomes more interesting. We're going to assume that the image of X under A is a linear subspace, okay? It's a linear subspace. So if that happens, if that happens, I'm still thinking about the same, um, the same, least squares function here, right? Ax minus b square. So if that happens, then the smooth, the relative smooth um, smoothness constant is this quantity. is It's easier to see it in, in a picture here. We take the triangle illustrates the image of the cone intersected with uh, the unit ball. So that is, we take the image of every element in the cone that has norm at most one. The image of that uh, set now is not necessarily going to be an ellipsoid, is not necessarily going to be symmetric. So if this was a picture in, uh, if, if the cone was in R3, then A of that set would look like a, something somewhat similar to a triangle. So that's why I drew it that I sketched that a triangle. That's, uh, the black set is that set, this, the image of X intersected with a unit ball under A. The blue circle 
is the smallest ball that is centered at the origin that contains that set. That, the radius of that uh, guy, the radius of that guy is the square root of the uh, smoothness constant L, and the relative smoothness constant L. Now, if we look at the red circle, the red circle is the largest circle that you can squeeze inside that uh, set that is uh, centered at the origin. So the, 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 the precise expression for the radius of that uh, circle is what is written here in the second uh, equation. That is uh, the square root of the strong convexity uh, parameter. So you have something that is kind of, I, I would like to, I, 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 I suggest that this picture, this picture is the uh, generalization of the picture that I showed earlier. So let me actually do something that maybe violates some rules of uh, presentations, but look at the picture on page 13. That is a generalization of the picture on page five. Okay, it's, it's a non-Euclidean extension that now includes the, the relative context of this picture. Okay, so that's what we just saw there. So that's the second example. Now, there are, uh, there are, what is behind these two identities is uh, has to do with the results that I'm going to describe in the in, a little bit later in the talk. Uh, these are this could be verified directly, but you know they take a, the, the calculations to check to check this take a little bit of work. They're going to be very straightforward from a couple of results that I'm going to show a little bit later in the talk. Uh, so here is some something that I like to mention because uh, it illustrates what we get by using uh, the flexibility of reference distance functions. So the squared norm is just take the norm, take the square and divide by two. We can use that distance function. We could actually use this distance function for any norm. It doesn't have to be the Euclidean norm. It could be, for example, the one norm or infinity norm or you know, any norm in principle. Uh, another reference distance function that is extremely uh, useful, especially for uh, first order methods is the Bregman distance. Uh, and the Bregman distance here could be of a difference function than the function that we are trying to optimize. Typically the Bregman distance is for some kind of reference function that is, it adapts nicely to the geometry of the set uh, X. So if H is some kind of reference differentiable convex function. Uh, in, in first order algorithms, we frequently use the Bregman distance of, uh, of H. And in fact, I'll illustrate that a little bit later in a couple of slides. Another distance that uh, we discovered while we were writing this paper that in, in retrospect turns out to be actually a very natural distance is uh, for the case when the set is bounded, when the set, the, the reference set is bounded, there is a distance that in some way is very intrinsic to the set. And we call this distance the radial distance, the radial distance. So I, I use this fancy R to describe the radial distance. And the fancy big R is the square of little r divided by two, where the little r is this expression that you see there at the bottom, which is nothing else, but if you, if you are an expert in convex analysis, you probably will recognize this real quick. This is just the um, gauge uh, function. So the radial distance has this, if we look at the, the level sets of the radial distance, is this, uh, the, these are the level sets. So it's essentially the gauge function of the set X shifted so that uh, it, it, the, the radial distance is centered at whatever the second argument here is. So for example, if the black set there is my set X and the point that I choose is uh, one half uh, zero, right? Then those lines that are colorful there, those are the level sets of that distance little r. And therefore for the square, you have similar uh, level sets, okay? It turns out that the radial distance is very interesting because in some way is very intrinsic to the set X. 
So I'll again illustrate that in, in just a, a few minutes with one of the results that I want to, um, to tell you about. So this was the first item, that was the construction and perhaps in some way the construction, if we, if we ended the talk here, the construction would be, would have limited interest because, well, you know, anybody could decide to construct maybe in some artificial way, some sort of uh, relative condition number. What is interesting about the construction is that we can connect it with the convergence of first order methods in a way that is very, very uh, analogous to how the classical condition number is related to the convergence of the uh, gradient descent, say. So that's what I want to tell you about next, the convergence of first order methods. And there are going to be a couple of statements here. The, before I even display the statements, I just want to say the, the punchline that I want to argue is that the same statement that we saw at the beginning of the talk for the, um, for the gradient descent essentially holds for at least two different algorithms, uh, the mirror descent algorithm and the Frank Wolf algorithm. So again, let's look at constrained convex optimization now. Okay, so remember we have, uh, we are interested in this constraint problem, minimize f of x over the set big X. Uh, let's call X star and F star respectively the uh, optimal set, right? The, the set of minimizers and the minimum value of F. Let's remember, let's recall the relative smoothness constant and relative strong convexity constants. The definition is here where that uh, set Z is defined uh, as at the bottom here, the kind of level set like uh, or zero set. Okay, now here is a classic algorithm, uh, the mirror descent, the mirror descent, think about it as, a, as a, an extension of the gradient descent, right? Uh, some of you probably know this pretty well. The advantage of mirror descent is that it applies to any domain not it, it, unlike gradient uh, it, it considers it, it applies to a constraint problem uh, the mirror descent can be seen as an extension of the projected gradient algorithm the projected gradient corresponds to the case when the reference function is the euclidean norm so mirror descent is uh it relies on a reference differentiable convex function and its breakman distance so the key the key step at each step, we, we compute this minimizer here. So the Bregman distance should be sufficiently simple so that we can, we can compute the minimizer. And that is a mirror descent. And again, think about this as a, an extension of uh, gradient descent. So here is the theorem that we uh, show. And what I would like to highlight here is the, the format of this theorem is nearly identical to the format of the uh, corresponding classical theorem that probably you can find in many optimization books for gradient descent. Uh, and the key is now the, the distance to the uh, set of minimizers, right? Uh, the iterates converge linearly to that uh, set of minimizers and the rate of convergence is the relative condition number. Likewise, the um, objective values of the iterates converge linearly to the optimal value. And again, the rate is determined by that um, relative condition number. So instead of mu over L, which is what we had for gradient descent, now we have the relative mu xd divided by L xd. You can see here why we were interested in our construction being flexible and incorporating non-Euclidean distances, because thanks to that feature, we can apply our construction to analyzing the, the mirror descent algorithm that relies on a non-Euclidean distance. The, the Bregman distance that is generated by the reference function here need not be um, a square norm. So that's one statement. And then the other statement is the Frank Wolf algorithm, another very popular first order algorithm. And the statement is strikingly similar to the statement for mirror descent and for gradient descent. 
uh, it is strikingly similar is the following. So first of all, what is the, the Frank Wolf algorithm? The Frank Wolf algorithm does not uh, rely on a projection of any sort. Uh, mirror descent, this is like a non Euclidean kind of projection. Uh, Frank Wolf, on the other hand, is a trade off. Instead of relying on a projection, oh, it has to rely on a linear oracle. So we compute the minimizer of the, uh, this linear form, right? defined by the gradient of f at the current iterate. And then we take a step towards that minimizer. Uh, and Frank Wolf uh, really had an enormous surge in popularity uh, a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago or so. Uh, and it's, it's, it's widely used for, it has, it has a, a many, many different uh, applications. What is really interesting about our work and how it connects to Frank Wolf is that again, the, the same statement that we uh, had for gradient descent and for mirror descent extends to uh, Frank Wolf. So we have that if these two guys, L and mu, and here is something that I would like to also highlight, the distance here that, that is, uh, is the, the right distance to use, the reference distance, to analyze the behavior of the Frank Wolf algorithm turns out to be the radial distance. Uh, it, this is something that essentially uh, developed as we were trying to connect our construction with the Frank Wolf algorithm. We realized that that was the, the key distance to introduce. And once we see that distance, this again has a strikingly similar, um, a strikingly similar format to what we had for gradient descent. If you're familiar with uh, Frank Wolf, you may have heard of a term that Jaggi coined that he called the curvature constant of a function on the set X. It turns out that that curvature constant is exactly our uh, smoothness constant L X, uh, F X R. Okay. Um, we show that in our paper. So those are uh, two statements. Let me uh, in the in the last few minutes, what I want to do is uh, give you some more technical, uh, a, a couple of technical statements about bounds on our relative condition numbers and a little bit of a geometric intuition. Um, so the the, uh, the the motivation for this is okay. So fine, we have a construction of a relative. Um, smoothness constant and relative strong convexity constant. What can we say about that? Uh, if, if, we have, uh, if, we, if we have a certain kind of uh, structure on the function f in terms of some other objects that we already know have some good properties, can we relate that somehow with uh, these constants? Can we determine if we, if we are building a particular or if we are dealing with a particular problem, is there a way that by looking at the building blocks of that problem, we can say something about how well behaved, how well conditioned that problem is going to be. So to ease exposition for the remaining, for the next few slides, I'm going to consider just the case when D is the square norm, okay? the, the Euclidean case. Our results hold more generally, but it's just simpler to keep this notation as the, the, the Euclidean norm. And I'm thinking about functions that are obtained in this form, some G function composed with some, say, linear mapping A or a matrix A. So suppose that A here is um, M by N, okay? Suppose that A is M by N. So then if we have a reference set X, I'm going to extend my, my, my definition of Z now to the matrix A kind of in a very straightforward way. The, the, the set Z is again the set value of mapping that to Y associates every other element in X that matches uh, whose value AX matches A of Y. And now if we have a cone uh, C in RN, we define A restricted to C as the set value of mapping that you would naturally guess. That is the matrix, the, the operator A restricted to C, that is A of X, if X is in C and empty otherwise. And we look also at the inverse of that mapping, which is 
a set value mapping that goes in the opposite direction. It's a set value mapping that uh, maybe may, may take multiple, um, the inverse may take multiple, uh, the inverse of the, the, the value map, the set value mapping inverse is a set value mapping in this case. So then we look at the norms of those two uh, mappings because they are going to play a key role in our statements. And we have a couple of statements here with that, that characterize the uh, smoothness or, or bound rather the smoothness constant and the strong convexity constant. So again, we look at this function that is the composition of G and some linear mapping A. So if the function G itself is smooth in the classical sense, then that property is inherited by F. And in fact, we can bound the relative uh, smoothness constant of F in terms of the smoothness constant of G times the norm of A restricted to this sub subspace. And this bound is actually tight in this special case when we have the uh, least squares function. The least squares function corresponds to the case when G is V minus B square. That, that would correspond to the least squares function. When that happens, then the, um, the bound that we had above, in this case, LG would be one. The, the, the function G is one smooth. And then we get that that is actually an identity. So that's an upper bound. The lower bound on mu is a bit more interesting. Uh, the lower bound, if we, um, if we have a convex cone and uh, the image of that cone under A is a linear subspace, and if the function G is strongly convex in the classical sense, then we can bound in the opposite direction. We have that mu is bounded above by the, the strong convexity constant of G divided by this norm square here. And once again, the, the, the bound is tight. If we look at the special case of least squares function, then this is an identity. In that case, mu G is one and we have an identity. So this is nice, but there is an important restriction here. And that is that A of X should be a linear subspace. The example that I mentioned earlier that I had that picture for essentially is, is an example of this statement. So if you apply that example to this particular case, if X is the non-negative orthon of dimension three, then that's what we get. The, the values of uh, the, uh, the mu value and L value correspond to respectively the norm of A restricted to X square and one divided by the norm of the inverse of A restricted to X uh, square. Uh, so let me just, this is maybe the most technical part of my talk. You can extend this to uh, when the reference set is a polyhedron. When the reference set is a polyhedron, in this case, the geometry gets, it, it's, it's a bit more technical, but it's also a bit, a, a lot more interesting because it has a very nice combinatorial uh, flavor. When the reference set is polyhedron, we have to look at the set of tangent cones of that uh, polyhedron. So that, that collection of tangent cones we call T of X. And then to incorporate the, 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 linear, up, the linear map A, we look at this T of A restricted to X, which is the cones here so that the image of those cones under A are a subspace. Uh, for example, if X is the non-negative orthon, then the, the tangent cones of the non-negative orthon correspond simply to a collection of uh, components that we uh, keep non-negative. And then T of A restricted to X, uh, they, they, uh, that holds if and only if this problem is feasible and the set I is uh, maximum. So these objects essentially capture some of the geometry of the polyhedron uh, X. And then what we get is this very nice uh, theorem that we can, again, lower bound the uh, strong convexity 
the relative strong convexity constant in terms of uh, that norm, but then we have to take a, a minimum over the whole collection of uh, tangent cones. And once again, the bound is tight. That is, if we look at the special case of the least squares uh, function, then we get that the mu actually matches that uh, quantity. Uh, there is a kind of a geometric intuition that is related to a cool picture here. The quantity that shows up here on the, at the bottom, one over this norm, uh, can be in some way visualized. Uh, so in a very special case, when my reference set is the, is the standard simplex, uh, it turns out that when we look at this thing here, this is uh, a, a uh, some, this is a term that we coined called the facial distance. So here, what is the facial distance of A? So A is, uh, uh, if you look at the convex hull of A, uh, phi of A, the facial distance is, what is, what are the two, uh, the distance between two faces of that, um, of that polyhedron, the two closest faces of that polyhedron. So if you look at say, if A is the identity in three dimensions, then this would be the facial distance, the, these two faces, one of a vertex and the opposite side. Th those are the two closest faces. If you look at I4, you have the tetrahedron and the two closest faces here are one edge and the other edge there. If you take any other pair of faces, their distance is um, bigger. So the, the quantity that shows up here in the theorem has this very neat uh, geometric interpretation, the facial distance, the facial distance. Okay, so I think I've, I've told you enough for now. Let me just wrap up the main message. My main story is you have this very classical uh, concept of condition number for a matrix and for a function, right? Uh, and for a function is smooth parameter, smooth constant divided by strong convexity constant. My main story is that we extend that to incorporate a reference set and a reference function. We connect it to convergence of first order methods and we can bound that when, uh, when the reference set is a polyhedron or when it is a cone. There are other technical developments that of course I didn't have time to get into. Uh, so this can be taken actually a little bit further. Uh, and if, if I managed to keep your attention this far, let me make a little advertisement here. Uh, the main reference for this is a paper that we published last year in math, math programming uh, with the same title of my talk. So uh, I wanna stop there and thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your attention. Uh, if you have any comment, I'll be happy to uh, take it now. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, uh, do, do we have any questions? Just if you have a question, please unmute yourself. I'll just ask. Andrew, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, a, a nice talk. Um, uh, I was just wondering, look, uh, th there's a generalization of the Frank Wolf method called the simplicial decomposition method where you, you'd sort of take more directions into account when you're doing the minimization. And it's, uh, it's, it's a relatively important extension. I was just wondering, have you thought about any extensions to that case? Uh, not exactly to that case, but one thing that I could say is um, we looked at a, a, another variation. It's, it's, it's somewhat related to your question, which is the Frank Wolf with away steps. The Frank Wolf with away steps, which um, so the classic Frank Wolf, they are, if you want, toward steps, regular steps that uh, move towards the towards a vertex. And the away steps essentially uh, uh, move away from points that are in the support of the current iterate. So it has a little bit of the flavor of what you're saying, mm. but it's not exactly the same algorithm. And very similar results hold for that algorithm. We did have to be a little bit more creative with the, uh, the, distance, the reference distance function that we needed to use. But essentially a very similar statement uh, holds there. Uh, I, we have not thought about what you are suggesting, but uh, this is one of the reasons that I am so eager to give this talk. I think this, that is a very natural uh, thing to look at. And, you know, it's something that 
it may be, it could be as easy as, uh, well, you know, obviously what you guys are doing has a straightforward extension to that, or it could, if it works, it could be that easy or it could require some more work. It's something that definitely someone should look at. And, you know, I'll, 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 I thank you very much for that suggestion. I'll try to look into that. All right. Thank you very much. Janos? Yeah. Um, so I have one question. I mean, you have this construction that basically factors out the, po the points where the function does not move, doesn't do anything. And this corresponds in your very first example, I think, to the um, zero um, singular values of the matrix, hmm? because that is basically encoding the subspace where it's not doing anything. But you yes. said um, your construction gives you the small gives you the smallest positive eigenvalue back, and maybe I, I missed something. But what if you have an even smaller negative eigenvalue? Shouldn't that then define the curvature, or did I miss something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me clarify that. No, no, it's not. It's not the smallest eigenvalue. It's the smallest singular value. It's a singular value. Okay. So uh, because and that that is really key both for the, um, yeah, so this is all, this is only singular values. So, you know, the, the, the thing that could happen is that if you have a, not a rank deficient matrix, you could have one or more zero singular values, right? Uh, but because we look at singular values as opposed to eigenvalues, then okay, uh, things okay. are all non-negative. Yeah, so then I misunderstood issue. that thing. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any more questions? Go in. First of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm not sure you can hear me. So my, I have two questions in here. So the first question is, uh, I was wondering, can you comment it on the uh, computational complexity in computing the corresponding uh, condition number in here? Yes, so computing this is not easy. Uh, and I have another project where we uh, look at this, uh, at the computation of this, or we look at something that is very closely related to the computation of these condition numbers. It turns out that um, a, at least when the reference set is a polyhedron, okay, when the reference set is a polyhedron, what is playing a role behind the scenes, this is something that took me a little bit of time to figure out, but it, in retrospect, it was very, it's, it's like when you, once you realize, once you understand something, as always, it seems obvious. The, for polyhedra, the key is that what we, what it, what plays a role here is a certain kind of Hoffman constant. Uh, so a Hoffman constant is essentially an error bound, and the Hoffman constants have been studied extensively, and it's been known that it's difficult to compute Hoffman constants. But we have a little project. Uh, that's an, another talk altogether about Hoffman constants and some algorithm to compute Hoffman constants. So in certain cases, in certain cases, when the polyhedron that you're looking at has some kind of, uh, how should I put it, like um, convenient uh, structure, you could compute it. It's a little bit like, a, it's, it's a lot like ma many combinatorial problems. You know, certain, in general, Many combinatorial problems are, of course, MP hard, but if you are lucky enough to come across a, a, a well-behaved instance, then in, in those cases, you can compute. Now, I, I want to also answer your question in a different way. This is part of another kind of uh, line of research that I have attempted to exploit, and I have made some progress along uh, in, in the last few years. Regardless of whether you can compute the condition number, uh, knowing that the analysis of your algorithm behaves, has a certain dependence on the condition number could help you in the following way. And this is an idea that I've, I've managed to um, materialize in a couple of projects. You attempt to solve your problem. And if you're fortunate enough to have come across a well-conditioned problem, then you will be happy because you finish it soon. If you, if you work and you cannot solve your problem, that means your problem is, uh, has a complicated conditioning. But the work that you did trying to solve it gives you a clue of how bad, where is the ill conditioning. And then you can in some way try to recondition your problem. 
There is another idea altogether that I uh, that I have uh, explored that again I can I can talk about in a different seminar, uh, but that's 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 what I can say about about your question. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I understand that the idea of uh, I mean. Um having some insight about the constant would help us to do some preconditioning kind of techniques, which is very good, I think. So my second question, let me see what my second question, sorry. <laughs> so my second question is about, um, so is, is this constant has any natural link to the res, uh, restrict isometric constant in here or? Oh, <laughs> I believe it does, uh, but I have to say, uh, so yes, I've, I've had a, a I have the idea that it does. So there is a project that Vera and I uh, completed. When did we get that finished, Vera? Maybe about a year ago. Uh, that it has some elements in common with what I presented today here that has a more direct connection with uh, certain uh, quantities that are not, it's not exactly the re restricted isometry property, but the kind of uh, geometry that plays a key role in um, signal recovery in compressive sensing. Because often it has to do with, uh, it's a certain kind of conditioning also. It has to do with how, how transversal a subspace is to a cone, uh, or you know, to, to what extent you can tilt a given subspace before the intersection with the cone uh, changes in some kind of a uh, key topological man manner. And it, th that is related to those, some of those properties. The, co the connection that you're referring to, which is with restricted isometry property, would be more elaborate, but it would have a similar flavor. And I, I suspect the answer is yes, but it's something that, to be completely honest, I, I, I haven't yet um, uh, explored sufficiently. And, you know, I don't know if uh, it, it, it could be. It could be also challenging. I, I, you know, I, to be completely honest. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the talk as well. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any more questions? Yes, I have a question. This is Luis. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not familiar with this Hoffman constant. So, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the connection? It sounded sure. interesting. Yes, I'll be happy to. And let me actually scribble something here. I am. I have been thinking about Hoffman constants for the last uh, few years. Let me let me uh, do a little kind of uh, advertisement here. I believe that the Hoffman constant is one of those subjects that is conspicuous, conspicuously missing from our regular uh, syllabus or curriculum in linear programming that we should be teaching our. Uh, PhD students in, in, you know, in their first linear programming course in, 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 in PhD programs, and it's the following. So there are various ways of uh, mentioning the Hoffman constant, but it's the following. This is Hoffman's lemma. Is suppose that um, A is a, a matrix, right? Then there exists a constant, H of A, okay? A constant, finite constant such that if this set, let's call it PAB, this is the polyhedron X such that AX less than or equal to B. Suppose that this polyhedron is non-empty, okay? Then, then for all U in Rn, the distance between U and the polyhedron is bounded above by uh, a u minus b plus oh, times h, of course. So this is what is called, this is an error bound, meaning you are trying to, to bound how far a point is, a trial point is from a solution set. So here the polyhedron is the solution set, is the set of solutions of the system of inequalities. How far is this? This can be bounded in terms of the residual of that point, u. So how far, this is very intuitive, right? If, if my point just barely violates the inequalities, it seems very natural to expect that it will be near a point that exactly satisfies the inequalities. So that's Hoffman's uh, lemma. And you know, this is not the only, th th this, is, this is like the, uh, what is this called? The, 
This was like the seminal, the original error bound. And error bounds have been studied extensively. I, I imagine there's a good chance that some people in the audience will, will know a lot more about error bounds than I do. Uh, they are related to uh, um, a lot of uh, results and developments in variational analysis. Vera probably knows a lot about that as well, as well as others. Uh, this is just the, the linear case. If you have, uh, say, um, other more general functions here, then there are error bounds that apply in, in that other, in, in more generality. Um, so the, some of the technical statements that I displayed in my talk here, some of the main machinery behind that is really related to the Hoffman constants and how this behaves. What I called the facial distance, you could see the facial distance as a type of uh, Hoffman constant, basically. So, so I hope that this helps, uh, Luis. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, any any more comments or questions? So, there seem to be no more questions. That's um. That's a substantial discussion. So thank you very much, Javier, uh, for the very interesting talk. So uh, before, before we finish today, there's a small announcement. Unfortunately, the next speaker, Valentin Grechavik, has, was canceled, his talk was canceled, but uh, we'll have his talk later when he's available. And next time we'll have, um, I think, Alex talking, right, Alex? Okay, I'm happy to do this. And I'm happy also to be motivated by, by what Javier was talking about. And I will probably continue on Hoffman uh, constants. Yeah, so, so Javier, in fact, we have an expert on error bounds here. Um, Alex oh, there you is, go. is, is one of them. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. Thank you, by the way, yeah. Javier, for the talk and for the motivation. Well, thank you very much again, uh, you know, and thank you for the discussion. This is this is this is very fun. Thank you very much. Keep coming. <laughs> sure. Yeah, please keep connecting, and everybody, please, um, you know, check the recordings if you missed the talks. And the, thank you very much, everybody. So I guess, um, yeah, we will meet next week. Good. Good day. Please come. Thank you. Thanks very much.